Seems like a crazy question, doesn't it? What if the church was the church? What if the church acted like the church? What if the church did exactly what the church claims has been done to them? The, the redemption that the church claims has happened in their lives. What would happen? I mean, sometimes we have to ask these simple questions, you know? Sometimes we have to ask the question, why is it that just when I'm ready to start this message, Word decides to update? Now that, okay, all right. <laughs> I want us to just look at the, a, a small passage of Scripture to get started here. You can go ahead. It'll be on the screen. Um, we'll, we'll get you to uh, maybe look up some Scriptures here in a bit, but let's just look at this one. From 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and now it is already in the world. This was a long time ago. And we spent a good bit of time going through 1 John but uh, a, a while back. But to remind us, Here's John toward the end of his life <coughs> reminding the church to be on guard. He starts off this chapter by saying that, you know, not every spirit that, that tries to influence you is from God. And we have to discern spirits. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is discerning of spirits. That's not human <coughs> spirits. I've heard people talk about, well, I have discernment, and they try to judge what's going on in somebody's heart. That's not what discernment is, yeah. at least in that case. Discerning of spirits is knowing what the source is of whatever is happening. Not every spirit is from God. We're supposed to test the spirits to see if they're of God. And there's a litmus test, and right there it is. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It's pretty simple. If, if someone preaches to you, whether they're called a pastor or whether you're in a building called a church, and they don't preach Jesus, that Jesus is from God, that He has come in the flesh, that He's God incarnate, then that's not from God. Amen. And that's a simple discernment. And uh, I think today, as maybe never before, we have to be aware of this, that not everything that sounds churchy, not everything that sounds religious comes from God. He goes further here and says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus as Lord is the spirit of Antichrist. Well, ant is a small a, in this case, some translations capitalize it, but really, anti means opposed, right? It can also mean another. Paul warns us that if anyone <laughs> preaches another Jesus, that we're not supposed to listen to. John is the only New Testament writer who was credited with using the term that we translate Antichrist. Maybe some of you don't believe that, but it's only in the epistles that we read about that. Even in Revelation, we don't read that term, but we understand who Antichrist is. So, depending on your eschatology, if the church is still on the earth, when, as Paul called him, that son of perdition comes, we will certainly need to stand against him. We certainly will. Jesus in Matthew 24 says, those who endure to the end will be saved. This, this, this flies in the face of repeat some prayer and then just go back to living like you want to. Hmm. The New Testament doesn't teach that. Right. Men have teached that. The New Testament does not. Following Jesus means following Jesus. Amen. And we have compartmentalized this thing to say, well, does that mean I lose my salvation? What are you worried about? What, why do you even ask the question? Just follow Jesus, right? right? right. It, it's, it's like 
we, we want to inoculate ourselves, mm -hmm. like a get out of hell free card. Just follow Jesus. Jesus himself, when speaking of the end times in Matthew 24, is very careful to say, those who endure to the end will be saved. Now, no doubt there are things to be against. There are principalities. There are spirits that do not come from God. But our stand against must never be toward people, but to evil itself. I've met quite a few ch churchgoers that don't agree with that. And they may not say it in so many words, but to hear them talk, you think that everybody that's not them is of the devil. Pick your politician and, and call, them, uh, call them Satan. And the danger in that is if everybody in your camp is okay, and everybody in their camp is not okay, what happens when someone comes into your camp who is of the devil? Ooh, got quiet. The churchgoers that I've met that seek to vilify people, many of them have simply identified scapegoats in the form of people to justify their miserable existence. It's almost like we're really preaching the gospel now. We're going to tear everybody else down. They gloss over some scriptures. Philippians 2, 14 to 15. Paul instructed the believers in Philippi, do everything without complaining and arguing. This is the church. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So, in the last four or five years, I've written this book, and it's actually in the process of being published. And I've been going through a lot of stuff. I'm so tired of looking at this book. I really am really weary of reading it, because you read it many, many times by the time you get done getting everything laid out. But there's a chapter in there. I, let me just back up. The title is, What Do You Think Would Happen? Dot, dot, dot. And the first part of the book is, If the Church, fill in the blank. If the Church got its politics in perspective. If the Church really prayed. Kind of what that little video said. If the Church would be the Church. And one of the chapters is, if the anti-church figured out what it's for. The anti-church is not about those who are against the church. The anti-church is not the group outside of the walls that wants to do everything they can to make sure that we cease to exist. The anti-church is not a group of people that are seeking to replace the church. My definition is Churches who are comprised of people who seem to be against everything and everyone while knowing little of what they're actually for. The world has a pretty good idea of what we're against. I think they should equally know, if not more, what it is that we're for. Now, I've been to some of these anti-churches over the years. Maybe you have too. As I was an itinerant ministry for 27 years, the great thing is I could always leave. <laughs> but I've been to some of these anti-churches. They attract and they're comprised of people who seldom smile. They are the self-appointed joy killers and they will suck all the victory out of the room. <laughs> the pastor doesn't preach right. The worship songs are all wrong. After all, if Jesus were here, we'd sing out of the hymnal. The kids are all disrespectful. Most everyone they know is not following Jesus, except for them, of course. It's everyone else's fault that things are the way they are. And meanwhile, the world is watching. 
And they're saying, why in the world would I want to go there? There are those who are under genuine conviction of sin who don't feel they have any place to go where they're not reminded of past encounters with Pharisees. Now listen, I know some of that's edgy, and if you don't like edgy stuff, you probably won't want to read this book. Now that I've encouraged you, (laughs) the purpose is not to be edgy, the purpose is to make us think. And you may say, well, I've never experienced that. Well, praise the Lord for that. I sure have. And and the whole the whole thing of the, the Pharisees, the self righteous, who who will just look for anybody to blame except themselves. I feel no hate for the Pharisees of today. I only feel sorrow that they, they somehow think they aren't standing for Jesus unless they're railing against everyone else. It takes a special combination of patience and, and honesty to deal effectively with such people. And I think most people, would, including pastors, would just as soon walk on by. I also have great compassion for those who have been on the receiving end of such self-righteousness, whether they've chosen to remain uh, connected to a local church or if they've just said, I'm done. That's a new category that George Barna uh, gives us when we look at church the church health, the duns, the duns. The duns are the ones that have been there, done that. All they ever saw was Sister Bertha better than you, telling them what a miserable sinner they were and that everything they did was wrong. And they said, you know what, I don't need this. And honestly, in some cases, I can't blame them. I can't. How can you blame them? But I have compassion for those who have been on that receiving end. Now listen, I'm not placing all the blame on the church, but the church has to accept her fair share. I say it often, isn't it incredible that this incredible, this powerful organization, it's it's actually an organism, this living, breathing organism called the church, that God established, that Jesus is the cornerstone of, that he established it on earth, and then as he ascended, he said, okay, now you run it. So no one's going to be perfect. We're all going to do things, and we're all going to say things that maybe we shouldn't say. We're all going to get a little bit protectionist of ourselves. Who likes to just be totally transparent and say everything that's going on? Maybe not, but we can all be genuine, right? People are looking for the real thing. But I want to extend some empathy to the ones who are done. And I want to extend some sympathy to the self-righteous because God loves them all. And the church is designed at the very root of this is to minister to everybody. But you know what? Leading the self-righteous and the duns to Jesus doesn't usually happen by just having more church services. It's the metric that we use all the time. I'm about to fill out the the annual church ministries report, and they're going to want to know some numbers, right? It's a lot easier than it used to be. (laughs) Brother Dan, every year it gets more simple. It's one page. It used to be four pages. Yeah. And... uh, But they want to know what our average Sunday morning attendance is. They want to know how many people are born again, people filled with the Spirit, the the age group, all of those kind of things. But it's not just having more church services because there's no lack of church services to attend. If it was all about coming up with more church services to reach these people, we would be busting at the seams. It requires a change culture. The kind of change in culture that people recognize here, if I can brag on you for a little bit, when they walk in the door. As soon as I walked in the door, I knew there was something special here. Very rarely is there any battle at all when it comes to the self-righteousness or 
with someone who feels like they've been belittled. And I compliment you for that. And it's, it's more of a rarity than I even want to admit. Praise God. But this has to be maintained. This has to be guarded so that the, the weeds don't take over. And it requires consistently coming under the authority of Christ. It requires challenging ourselves to growth in Christ. It requires an opposition to the same old thing. Because you know what happens? Comfort, comfort, comfort can be the killer of evangelism. Comfort can, can be the killer of refusal to change, can just get to a place where, well, we're just doing this, we're in a good rut. I like this rut. I'm comfortable in this rut. And, and we're not doing anything evil by staying in this rut. Yeah, but we're not fulfilling the mission of the church. And that is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. If we don't change, we die. I'm not talking about change in biblical truths. I'm not, not talking about any of that. I'm talking about the way that we live out our mission. Not willing to, to be comfortable. And then continually looking outward and onward. And, and we've got so many good discussions, different groups going on. We, we've got a lot of meetings, but they're productive meetings. And we're talking about how can we reach this group? How can we? And sometimes there's just way too much going on in my head. And I just, I want to go find a, a cabin in the woods, right? It's kind of decompressed. But I'm excited that there's so much going and, and minds turning and allowing God to speak to us. You might say, well, I think most people understand this, but, but I don't think that's true. Some people would say this is blasphemy. Any change at all is considered to be of the devil. Now listen, there are some hills worth fighting for, and there are some hills not worth fighting for. But many church people mistake molehills for mountains. And, and they just can't get over this little bump in the road. I'm required to what? I'm required to change but I like this. And some of them are, can I just say honestly, that biblically illiterate that they think what they're fighting over actually appears in the Word of God. And in many cases, it doesn't. So there's that resistance to change that if we allow it to, to come, if we allow religion to replace a relationship with God, if we stop looking outward at those who don't know Jesus, if we lose our empathy and our heart for people who are lost, that status quo, that can just threaten everything because beneath that resistance to change the status quo is a motivation that may at first look like it's standing for authenticity and orthodoxy, but it doesn't. In many cases, the things that are biblically Grounded are the things that get dismissed and changed. And the things that are just about the way we do what we do become elevated. And then one day you look around and nobody's here. Because who wants to come be a part of something that has no power? Who really wants to follow a Jesus that is just relegated to the history books? Or, or religion that, that is displayed on our walls and memorial plaques and all of those things. But there's no fire. But when you push, <laughs> when you press against these things, these sacred cows that have no biblical value, you find out where the true motivations lie. Amen. I told you the other month, I was having a discussion with, with somebody who is of a, a more liturgical church. And I had mentioned that, no, we don't repeat the Lord's Prayer on Sunday morning. And this person said, you call yourself a pastor. And you don't repeat the Lord's Prayer. And I said, um, okay. What could I say? Where is this written that you have to, to do this? Nothing wrong with it. But you're telling me that it's not repeated week after week. People don't have any idea what it means. 
right? Most people like to be comfortable. And a threat to that comfort earns a negative reaction. In, in many cases, the greatest, uh, the greatest resistance to change occurs when these non-biblical standards are violated. I gave you some examples. Worship service time. Well, we've always started at 10 o'clock. What if somewhere down the line we needed to change to 930 for the sake of people who don't know Jesus? And I've never had anyone tell me here, it was a little long today, Pastor, but some churches they sure would. Or the order of worship. No one knows what's going to happen, usually including me. And, and there's a reason for that. I do not want us to get into comfortable ruts. How about version of the Bible? There's an entire churches based upon a particular version of the Bible. Or a dress code. Everybody knows you don't wear jeans into church. Why? Why not? What we sit on. That's right. And everybody knows a pew is more sacred than a chair. What we walk on. Okay. Where we meet. What it looks like. Well, you couldn't meet in that warehouse. That's, everybody knows you can't do that. That doesn't look like a church. What we do. Oh, uh-oh. Our busyness. It may not be leading anybody to Christ, but boy, we've been doing this for a long time. Sometimes you've got to look at what you do and be willing to change it. The traditions that we embrace. This church building is, uh, what, 73, uh, 46, almost 47 years old. Uh, it's long enough to build some traditions, but at least it's not 100 and 46 years old, because then you'd say, my great-grandfather sat right over here. <laughs> and sometimes, I get in trouble, I used to say this to Melody about a particular church that was very, very steeped in the way it's always been. And she told me to stop saying it, and my comment was, nothing a good fire wouldn't fix. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing you can do is get out of the building. See, those who resist change think that they're standing on biblical grounds when in fact they're only defending their personal preferences. Sometimes even to the point, even to the point of allowing the spirit of Antichrist to step in. Funny thing is, that many people refuse to change even if they're not happy where they are currently. That happens with church growth. Pastor, we want you to grow this church, but we don't want to change a single thing about what we're doing. I hear that sometimes more often than I wish I heard it. Not here, you don't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I brag on you all the time. Amen. You know, a lot of times, if you're not, even if you're not happy where you're at, at least it's familiar, right? <laughs> at least you don't have the unknown. But where does faith come into the picture, mm -hmm. right? If we aren't willing to get out of what's comfortable and familiar, how can we say we're walking and living by faith? There's, also, there's death, see, in predictability sometimes. Jesus' own words prove this in his uh, conversations with the Jewish leaders. You know, he didn't have harsh words for sinners, did he? They understood him. They knew they needed a Savior. He had his harshest words for those who didn't think that they needed saving. And he said to them one time in John 5, 39, You search the Scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the Scriptures point to me. See, the motivations of the Jewish leaders were comfort and sustainability of comfort. They were expecting Messiah to come, but they had convinced themselves what his arrival would look like. And when Jesus didn't look like that, they did everything they could to get rid of him. 
So rather than change their traditions, or rather than change their status quo, they sought to eliminate the one who was disturbing the familiar. Even when the very scriptures that they were searching testified of him. Some people do that today. They'll search the scriptures for one verse to justify their belligerence rather than allowing their their comfortable, familiar ways of thinking to be disrupted by a God who is always leading us forward and never backward. It's just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. The Pharisees in the anti-church of today are often jealous of the blessings that they see in other congregations, and they'll make up excuses. The ones who are making a difference in the kingdom of God, they'll find something to criticize just so that they can feel more spiritual. The larger church, well, they can't be large. They must be doing something wrong. The other side of that is it's not being large that makes you good, and it's not being small that makes you good. It's being authentically followers of Jesus that makes it a good church. Uh, I, 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 I even heard somebody say this. Well, we may be small, but at least we're not like them. And them is people are getting saved, filled with the Spirit. Church isn't better because it's bigger, and it's not better because it's smaller. But most anti-churches are small churches. Us four and no more. They see a church of any size as apostate, not because they actually are, because they must be, or else they wouldn't be successful. And I'm not trying to depress you this morning. I'm really not. But listen, I've seen so much of this nonsense over the years that I'm sick to my stomach. And I just want to prepare you that as God continues to bless and stretch and grow this church, you're going to hear from the anti-churches. You just are. Wonder what they're doing there. That more people are coming there. Oh, that's the, that's that place where women have to wear dresses all the time. I've heard that. I don't know how many times. That's that place where they think if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. The unbelieving world has a pretty good idea what the church is against. So when we hear stuff like that, if we hear stuff like that, what is our response? Well, we need to find out what we're for, not what we're against. The joy of serving together here with you is that I rarely hear antagonistic statements like this. Very rarely does anything raise its head like that. And I think that's awesome. Amen. Amen. There's good air here, you know. Healthy place to be. There are always issues to work through. We are people, and people have people problems, right? Yeah. But I believe that the love of God just uh, overwhelms, and certainly there's nothing that we cannot work through and grow through. God is growing all of us together, and it's a great experience. I would say that uh, everybody here, or at least most of you, know that just talking about and complaining about something doesn't fix it, right? It just makes you more miserable. (laughs) It doesn't accomplish anything. We take a proactive approach, and that's good. Still, we've got to maintain this by stretching ourselves, keeping our eye on reaching those without Christ, seeking how God can use us with new ministries and outreaches and finding new ways for us to grow together, opportunities to use and practice our giftings together. That's why we change things up once in a while. Recently, we're in the process, and we've told you about changing up some things with how we do face-to-face, ways that we get together, not on a Sunday morning. Uh, A good example is our our Wednesday night Bible studies. They have really grown from about six people 
to about 25 to 30. Yes. And, and it's grown, yeah. yeah. And it's, but what's, what's, what's important to realize is if we don't change things up, we're going to find ourselves a real comfortable rut where you can just come in, sit down, listen to me, Gab and Yak, and, and although we have really good interaction with people, but we've got to move on. We've got to figure out a way to, where do we go from here? So we're a tight group on Wednesday nights. There's great discussion. There's great input. There's a real freedom, don't you think? Uh, people can feel free to make comments. We've got a, a lot of topics and different methodologies. Um, for us to move into a larger building like moving in here would kind of defeat the purpose because it's not another service that we're looking for. It's another experience. So in dreaming about what is next, how do we continue to grow what has been so beautifully instituted and take it to the next level? How can we not only grow ourselves, but grow others? How can we grow outward? How can we reach the duns? How can we reach the Pharisees? How can we reach the people that their whole list of what you do in church happens in this room? Sometimes you got to get them out of this room to realize that, oh, we don't have to do this, 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 and this, right? Real discipleship and real life change usually happens after we leave this room. So, I just wanted to let you know of a few things. You know someone else that we have to reach? The cultural Christians. And you know what? It's a dying breed. And that's not a bad thing. The, the cultural Christians, the ones, well, everybody knows you go to church on Sunday. Well, everybody knows it lasts an hour. Well, everybody knows you repeat the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. Everybody knows you sing the Gloria Patria. Everybody knows you sing three hymns and no more. Everybody knows, and, and that's as deep as it goes. And what's painful to watch from just a human perspective, it's painful to watch that go away because we think, isn't it more than just going through the motions? But at the same time, the less cultural Christianity it, that exists in a society that is increasingly secular, the more the children of God are going to be effective. Yeah. We are faced, friends, with a decision to make. Are you going to just coast and show up in a building with orange pews and orange carpet? <laughs> or are you going to really follow Jesus? follow Jesus? That's the choice that we're presented with. Yeah. If you want to coast, those churches that will allow you to coast are, are going away. They're going away. There's a major denomination that I looked at statistics just for the churches in our part of the state, and there was probably 50 of them that averaged 10 or less on a Sunday morning. It's going away. But if you really want to dig in and serve the Lord, and you are seeking the Holy Spirit's empowerment, man, oh man, just think about what the church could do. What do you think would happen if the church decided to be the church? 